Hey everyone, we're just going to let people um, come into the room. So we're just going to, we'll start in about 30 seconds. Okay, um, welcome everybody to uh, Politics and Pandemic. It's our first um, publishing series event of uh, this very, very strange year that we're all living through. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, and before we get started and I introduce you to our panelists, I just wanted to mention, we'll be doing two more events uh, in the spring um, uh, and we'll be announcing those over Emerson College's various social media um, places over the next um, couple months. Um, one will probably uh, be a magazine pitch slam for students who are uh, interested in pitching ideas to magazine editors. And then we also have Radhika Jones, um, the editor-in-chief of Vanity Fair, who will be uh, with us in the spring as well. Um, so I just wanted to talk about a few little things that we're doing during this event. Again, we're going for uh, 90 minutes. Um, we have closed captioning available. So click on the little CC button at the bottom to turn on uh, subtitles. Um, there's also a Q&A button, which you'll probably see at the bottom. And we're gonna be probably for the last half an hour or so, uh, maybe longer, um, I'll be asking the panelists questions that you all have. So you can ask those questions in the Q&A and we'll, we'll be curating them and um, picking out some of the ones to, to ask. If you can please um, just include your name and uh, your age. And if you're an Emerson student, if you can um, tell us what you're studying, that would be great. You don't have to do your full name, but a, a first name would be really good and helpful. Um, this event is uh, being streamed on Facebook as well as being recorded. Um, and you may have noticed if you um, had Googled Olivia Nuzzi before this uh, event that Dahlia Lithwick is not uh, Olivia Nuzzi. Um, Olivia is covering the Trump campaign. Um, and as you can imagine, is very busy today. So she had to um, drop out. And Dahlia um, incredibly generously uh, agreed to join us uh, today. And she has to leave at seven, unfortunately, because she has to give a speech, but um, she'll be here until then. Um, and Dahlia has been one of my favorite writers for a long time. So I'm glad you're here, Dahlia. Um, all right, so I'm gonna um, read some short bios of our panelists and then we're gonna get started. Um, so this is the longest you'll hear me talk um, uninterrupted probably. Um, so Aaron Haynes uh, is a fellow at the Georgetown Institute of Politics and editor at large of the 19th, a nonprofit nonpartisan newsroom focused on the intersection of women, politics, and policy. Uh, prior to joining the 19th, Aaron was a national writer on race and ethnicity for the Associated Press. She's also worked at the Washington Post, the Orlando Sentinel, and uh, the Los Angeles Times. Aaron is a frequent contributor to several media outlets on issues of race, gender, and the 2020 presidential election, uh, including MSNBC, CNN, and NPR. She's an Atlanta native and is currently based in Philadelphia. Aaron, welcome and thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Sewell Chan is the editorial page editor at the Los Angeles Times um, and someone I've known for many, many years, although I don't remember how many years, but it's been a long time, um, where he oversees the editorial board and the op-ed and Sunday opinion pages. Before joining the Times in 2018, Sewell worked for five years at the Washington Post and 14 at the New York Times, where he was a Metro reporter, Washington correspondent, deputy op-ed editor, and international news editor. A native New Yorker, Sewell grew up in an immigrant family and was the first in his family to finish college. He graduated from Harvard with a degree in social studies and received a master's degree in politics from Oxford, where he studied on the British Marshall Scholarship. Uh, Alec McGillis 
is a senior reporter for ProPublica and the recipient, oh, Sewell, hi. Sorry to not say hi. <laughs> um, Alec McGillis is a senior reporter for ProPublica and uh, the recipient of the George Polk Award, the Toner Prize for Political Reporting and other honors. He previously worked at the Washington Post, Baltimore Sun and the New Republic and his journalism has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, the New Yorker, the Atlantic and other publications. Alex ProPublica reporting on Dayton, Ohio was the basis of a PBS frontline documentary about the city. He's the author of The Cynic, a 2014 biography of Mitch McConnell, which I'm gonna ask him about today, and is currently finishing a book on regional inequality in America called Fulfillment, Winning and Losing in One Click America. Um, Alec just told us before this started that he um, finished another draft uh, today. So congratulations, Alec, and thank you for doing this. Dahlia Lithwick is a senior editor at Slate and in that capacity has been writing the Supreme Court dispatches and jurisprudence columns since 1999. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Harper's, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, The New Republic, and Commentary. She's a host of Amicus, Slate's award-winning bi-weekly podcast about the law and the Supreme Court. In 2018, Dahlia received the American Constitution Society's Progressive Champion Award and the Hillman Prize for Opinion and Analysis. She also won a 2013 National Magazine Award for columns on the Affordable Care Act. Dahlia earned her BA in English from Yale and her JD degree from Stanford. Uh, and she's currently working on a book, new book, The Lady Justice for Penguin Press. So um, thanks again for doing this, Dahlia. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so thank you all and um, welcome to those of you who are here. I know some of you are students and some of you are not and some of you are my students because I made you come. But um, thanks for being here. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of things um, over the next uh, 80 or so minutes um, about um, and since this is a publishing series, we will be sort of keeping the focus as much we, as much as we can on um, media coverage, journalistic coverage of uh, what's happening in the world right now, uh, both in terms of um, newspapers, magazines, um, and how they're covering our times. Uh, we're gonna be talking about a, an area that really interests me, which is the um, what has the media covered well uh, during this uh, pandemic and what stories haven't been told or have been told poorly. So we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, if, if Olivia had been here, I would have asked her to start us off with, you know, you know, what she knew about the chaos that's happening today. Uh, you may have heard Trump is um, supposedly leaving the hospital in, I don't know, 18 minutes. Um, so we'll see if that happens. Um, and, um, and we will be talking a little bit about uh, this current moment, literally the last few days, um, at various points throughout the evening. But I actually want to start um, with uh, something else. I want to look back slightly to the debate from last week, um, which feels like a long, long time ago. And then I want to look forward to the vice presidential debate um, on Wednesday. That's happening in uh, two days. Um, and Dahlia, um, I, I want to start with you on this, uh, and then I want to bring in Aaron as well. Um, and I'm just going to read a um, just a paragraph from a piece that you wrote, Dahlia, um, the day of or the next day, which was really uh, outstanding in which you attempted to sort of make sense of that um, catastrophe of, um, of a debate, um, if we can even call it a debate. Um, and you did mention something that I thought was really interesting. You talked about how Biden, you know, even though he survived, and I don't know if you mentioned this, but, you know, he missed some chances um, uh, in that debate, one thing that you thought he did well um, was this, and I'm just going to read the paragraph. What Biden did on Tuesday that matters more than anything else was to remind us how to keep Donald Trump out of our heads in the weeks before the election. In the most technical brass tax formulation he could muster, he simply told everyone who wants to be counted how to do that and where to do that and why they in fact do that Donald Trump will be gone in January. The debate was a misery to the extent we had to witness yet again broken truth, shattered norms, and needless abusive cruelty that Trump acts out for his base on every stage and in every forum. 
but it was a triumph as a mechanism for reframing the idea of power and agency and hope, none of which Donald Trump controls and none of which should be surrendered when it is needed most. And you talked about it in the context of Anat Shankar Arsario, who's a progressive specialist in messaging. And I spent some time with her in Ohio months ago, right, as, right pre uh, pandemic. And she was trying to help progressive activists be better at persuasion. She believes that especially progressive activists are really not very good at it. And a lot of their instincts are not uh, particularly great. And I know that Anad is, is constantly talking about how progressives need to not take the bait and change the conversation. Um, so I, I'm curious, Dahlia, what you thought about um, that moment and why you thought that moment was so um, important and, and powerful. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. And it's this is just an amazing panel. It's a treat to be with everyone. Um, you know, I, I think what I've been really struck by um, for the past four years is the willingness of the press, with massive exceptions, uh, to meet Trump on Trump's terms. And whether it was the 2016 campaign where we gave him a kafillion hours of unfiltered uh, coverage or just all the ways in which we endlessly repeat the error of engaging with him on his terms. And it's, it's really hard not to. And if I could just tell one tiny story that clarifies, I was just saying right before we went live, you know, we lived in Charlottesville, Virginia for 18 years. We were there when the Nazis marched. My son, who was like 10 at the time, 10, yeah, uh, uh, said to me the day before the Nazis marched as everyone was anguishing about how to redirect attention away from Nazis with flaming torches, said to me, you know, if we all stay home and shut our doors, they win, they get all the press. If we go out on the streets and fight them, they win, they get all, like there's no place to move. And that's kind of just become my touchstone of, you can't keep getting yourself into these lose-lose situations uh, as the press where engagement uh, is on their terms, uh, but you know, completely capitulating and letting them um, suck all the oxygen is also completely on their terms. And so I thought Biden had this really nice moment at the end of the debate. I mean, I think it was in the last five minutes, having really seeded so much to Donald Trump, just so much turf, um, to just look in the camera and say, look, I'm not even engaging with this person now. I'm going to tell you how to get your ballot. I'm going to tell you how to contest your ballot if you can't do it. I'm going to tell you how to get on this website. I'm going to tell you how to vote. I'm going to tell you it's going to be hard. You got to do And in that little three minutes, I felt like he was completely disaggregating the conversation from the whole circus that had happened before. And you know, I, I, I had been thinking about George Lakoff and the sort of truth sandwich and how the press has to present truth, lie, truth, rather than lie, truth, lie. And I thought that that was a really deft moment where instead of just saying, I'm gonna spend more time telling him to shut up, I'm gonna spend more time refuting things that are you know, demonstrably false. I'm just going to look at people and say, he doesn't control. He does not control whether you vote, you do. And I just thought that was exactly the framing that we've needed for four years. And that I think in some sense for me, shifted this to a sort of path through lose-lose. Yeah, and, and before I, I bring Aaron in, I just wanna follow up the, your one sort of, or I, you may have other, others, but one of your criticisms of the debate um, was, and you did acknowledge that it's sort of a complicated one because it's a complicated political question, but was when Biden ducked the, the question about adding to pre-port justices. Um, and you have a piece today, um, and it has a rather provocative um, headline, which now I can't find, but um, maybe you can tell us what it is, but it's um, where you're really, um, you're really urging um, Democrats to, um, to, to not play this game and to, and to be much more aggressive. I, I mean, I just think this is a sort of existential problem of the era of, you know, when they go low, we go high. When Trump gets sick, we wish him well. You know, when, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been dead for one hour and Mitch McConnell, you know, says like, 
tuck spikes the football and says, we're going to ram something through. Like we just are flat footed all the time. Um, and I think that my sense of, of that moment in the debate was that for Biden to sort of say, you know, we're going to really think about structural court reform in like seven years after, you know, we've won the House and we've won the Senate and we've reestablished the norms of comedy and, you know, respect in, in the Senate and Mitch McConnell's gone back to being like a really good guy. I just think, you know, by the end of this term, quite literally the end of the 2020 term, the ACA is on the chopping block. We learned today that marriage equality is on the chopping block voting rights as we know it, the census. I mean, it's all going through the wood chipper. And so I just think that there's this tendency to say we don't want to upset people. So we won't talk about court reform until seven years from now when we're like a smoldering ash heap. And I think that our point was like to, to, to sort of say, oh, it's a distraction or we don't want to make empty threats that'll scare the voters is another kind of iteration of the problem you led with, which is, you know, communicating that it's really super bad that there's going to be a 6-3 majority on the court for the next 20 years and we're going to do nothing about it because that would make us the bad guys. I just think it's a, a pretty tepid um, messaging strategy. Yeah. Um, Aaron, um, I, I want to bring you into both to just for a second for your thoughts and I know it, it feels like a long time ago about um, the debate uh, you had talked about, at least the headline in your piece um, was <laughs> really referring to toxic masculinity. And it was interesting because I hadn't thought, you know, we, we talk a lot about toxic masculinity, but even though that was so clearly on display there, I hadn't thought about it um, in that way exactly. Um, so I liked that you put it like that. Um, and I'm also curious, because you've, you've interviewed Kamala Harris, um, and I'm curious about what you are expecting on Wednesday from that debate, but what you're expecting and then what are the, what are the sort of the knee jerk ways that the press might cover this event on Wednesday? I know that you are talking to your students about, um, you're teaching an entire class on race and gender uh, and the 2020 election. Um, I think you have a class right after or right before the debate. Um, and and obviously this is, we're gonna be talking about race and gender, gender will be represented um, on Wednesday. And so I'm curious about what you're looking for with Kamala. There was, there was this idea among some pundits that, that Kamala was both a very good debater and then a not so great debater that she sort of disappeared in one debate. So I'm curious what you're expecting. Yeah, uh, well, so, okay, going back to last week, uh, I think a lot of us were just kind of shocked by what we, saw in some ways, I, you know, I don't think that anybody who's watched game footage of, of President Trump uh, in the debates of 2016, right, uh, or of the past four years did not think that he was going to not come in um, and attack uh, for the entire 90 minutes uh, and, and attempt to completely hijack the debate, um, you know, both um, his opponent and the moderator, which is exactly what happened. I think the only open question going into that debate was what was Joe Biden's response going to be? Was he going to actually have a response? Uh, what was Chris Wallace's response going to be? Was he going to be an effective moderator? And, you know, really what I just, I mean, toxic masculinity was the only thing that I could come away uh, with from that 90 minute exchange. I can't even call it a debate to your point uh, because that, that's not what it felt like. Uh, it felt like, um, yeah, watching um, a pissing match, <laughs> right? Uh, where uh, you know, th that, that felt immature. And yes, although, you know, President Trump was clearly the aggressor for uh, the entirety of, of, of the evening, uh, there were moments that Joe Biden did get sucked into that, right, where he did feel like he needed to kind of go toe to toe uh, with him uh, and and um, argue uh, with him, you know, try to um, like address the, the clear lies that, that the president was telling about him and, 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 and about his record uh, instead of uh, taking those moments to Dahlia's point to like really just kind of break that fourth wall and directly engage with voters. And, you know, the voters were the losers in that equation, uh, as I wrote in my piece, uh, because, the, you know, none of the issues that were uh, supposedly on the agenda that night, uh, the, the, the um, both of the candidates records um, COVID-19, hello, which is affecting everybody, whether you get sick or not, millions of Americans in this country, um, you know, race and violence in our cities, uh, which, you know, went 
completely left to a place that I don't think anybody expected around the white supremacy conversation um, and, and the integrity of the elections, right, where he's continuing to not um, agree to a peaceful transfer of power and continues to, to raise the specter of rigged elections and is openly calling for poll watchers to go to cities like Philadelphia, where I'm based. So, um, you know, the voters did not get any policy in that conversation. They did not get uh, any plans for how either of them plan to um, get the American people out of the economic and public health crisis that we have been in for the past several months and that we are going to be in for what looks like the next several months. Um, you know, because uh, we, we just really don't know um, and can't know uh, anything for certain from this administration about what uh, is going to happen next with the pandemic. Um, and so it was, it was, it was disappointing not just for its tone, but just because you had so many Americans that are finally tuning in to this election who were coming to that debate, not necessarily without a clear idea of whether they were gonna vote for President Trump or, Pres or Vice President Biden. I think that most people, I don't believe in like the idea of an undecided voter. I think they're just undecided about whether they're gonna participate in this election or not, but not who they're gonna vote for. Um, but they wanted to hear from both of the people who are attempting to be the next president of the United States about what the plan is for this country. And that just, that just wasn't present on stage. But what was present was a lot of personality, a lot of ego, um, and, and no policy, no plan. Um, and so that's what I wrote. Um, looking ahead to Wednesday, uh, and yes, my class is actually, pre, it's a pregame to, uh, to my discussion group. So I'm super excited to, to kind of hear from um, my class about what uh, they're going to be looking for in this debate because they are always very insightful and give me things to think about. Uh, many of them are first time voters, like I'm sure many of the people there uh, in this uh, conversation. So uh, I am really excited to be teaching in this um, semester with young people who are going to be voting for the first time. And, 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 and let me just say, like anybody who says that young people are not engaged in this election that don't care about our politics, like that's not true. Like every young person that I've encountered, uh, especially teaching, could not be more interested in the outcome of this election. It feels very consequential for a lot of you as well. And I, and I acknowledge and recognize that. Um, so um, it's interesting, uh, if we get in the way back machine, uh, Vice President Pence uh, got his start in politics as a radio host, talk show host. Yeah. So like he is a communicator, he is very effective and I don't think he should be underestimated as a communicator. Uh, I think maybe some people forget that, or maybe that wasn't as obvious four years ago because he was on stage with Tim Kaine, who is not necessarily known for his excitement or charisma, right? Um, but, um, but, but Mike Pence, is, he, he is somebody who is an effective communicator, and I think that um, we may see some of that. Um, the people that I talk to, I'm already hearing from so many um, folks who are ready to push back against what they expect to be gendered attacks against Senator Harris. Um, we've already seen President Trump kind of doing that. He continues to mispronounce her name, her first name, uh, which, I mean, hello, uh, she's the highest ranking Black female elected official in America. Like, you know what her name is. So, um, you know, but, but uh, so, so think, think like little digs like that. Um, people are already on the lookout for, ready to push back against on social media and on other platforms, warning the media not to buy into those gender narratives, not to perpetuate any of those gender narratives. Um, and, you know, Mike Pence is just, I mean, he is somebody who does not come from a culture of being around very strong women. And so uh, there's also a concern I'm hearing from people about um, him possibly kind of, um, being patronizing to her, you know, kind of like pat on the head, you know, like that kind of treatment, which, um, you know, they're saying, you know, they hope that she doesn't, that she doesn't get angered by that and like respond to that treatment. Uh, you know, so the, I mean, there will definitely be gender dynamics on full display. I mean, you know, we haven't seen that dynamic on a debate stage since, um, you know, 2000, um, 2008 with Sarah Palin. Uh, and so, um, so, so we're, we're seeing that now. I mean, yes, obviously Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, we saw that dynamic, but on the vice presidential stage, we haven't seen it in, in quite a while. And so it's gonna be really interesting to see how this plays out. Um, I think much like the uh, first presidential debate, this has the potential to really galvanize, especially minority voters, but Democrats in general um, who are watching this. Um, 
like I said, I think most people are pretty dug in in terms of who they're going to vote for. But we saw from um, the, pres the presidential debate, huge fundraising numbers on the Democratic side, huge volunteer numbers on the Democratic side. Uh, so that may also be an effect of this, uh, even if the debate really doesn't move the numbers in terms of who people are going to vote for that much. I think the energy uh, can definitely be um, jump started by what happens on Wednesday night, especially because people didn't get a real debate on uh, last week, right? So, so they're looking for some substance this week. And I'm curious, um, just quickly for you to talk, uh, we have um, some, I know we have some publishing students who are uh, watching and um, I'm curious, just if you could tell um, folks who are watching just a little bit about the 19th, oh, yeah, sure. which launched this summer. Um, and you know, in my in magazine classes that I teach, we're all, we're often talking about looking for, you know, areas that are not being covered well, or that are not being covered at all, or that are being covered in silly ways. And and I'm curious, as you all were launching the 19th, um, uh, what you saw as 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 missing, and and why you saw an opportunity. And then, if you want to talk at all, just re really briefly about anything you want to say about the business model, um, that would be great too. Yeah, uh, well, I'm happy to talk about the 19th anywhere and everywhere. Uh, as you said, we officially launched in August. Uh, our soft launch was at the beginning of this year in January. And so we've been out in the world uh, for about nine months, a little over nine months, and uh, launched right before the Iowa caucuses. Uh, I was on the campaign trail for the first three months of the year in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina. And then, of course, the pandemic happened and virtual campaign went into effect. And I've been pretty much grounded uh, since then, but still covering the campaign, but really had to pivot to cover uh, the pandemic and how women were really being disproportionately impacted by and responding to the pandemic. But uh, really the reason, just to back up, um, that I decided to join this newsroom, that I wanted to be one of the founding mothers that started this newsroom was um, because of the way that I saw legacy mainstream outlets covering this election. Uh, you know, we saw in 2016 that, that mainstream media largely missed the story around issues of race, issues of gender. And, and I saw a lot of those same mistakes being repeated headed into the 2020 election and frankly thought that that was unacceptable. And that was not limited to my outlet. I just, I saw that as something that was pervasive in our industry. And I knew that that was because we hadn't really made different choices uh, in terms of the storytellers and gatekeepers around political journalism, right? Like, which is overwhelmingly still white and male. And so while, um, you know, I do think we do have, I, I certainly have more company than I did in 2016 or even 2012 or 2008 um, in terms of reporters of color, in terms of women on the campaign trail, um, it's still not nearly enough. Uh, the representation is not nearly what it needs to be. And so what I ultimately decided was that the fastest and best way to really fix that and what I felt like was the most consequential election that I'm ever going to cover was to start over. And that's what we did. So, um, you know, the 19th is named, obviously, for the 19th Amendment, which, uh, you know, granted um, women their hard-earned uh, right uh, for access to the ballot, but our logo has an asterisk. If you've ever seen it, uh, that asterisk is in recognition of the omission of the Black women who were, frankly, thrown under the bus, um, you know, by the white women who uh, they fought shoulder to shoulder with for that right. Uh, and they would have to fight another half century for their access. Uh, to the ballot with the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which frankly they are still fighting for because uh, voter suppression makes their access to the ballot much more fragile. Uh, so um, in terms of our business model, we are a nonprofit um, newsroom, which uh, frankly I think is uh, the future of journalism. Uh, our um, funding comes from um, a few different pots. Uh, we have um, you know, philanthropy, private donors, and then we have an army of members who are amazing. I mean, giving in as little increments as $19 um, to say that they support our work and our journalism. And that really um, is very meaningful for us because um, the news that we produce is free to consume and free to republish, uh, which is a very important um, part of, of who we are as, as a newsroom. We want uh, whether people know they're reading a 19th story or not, we just want people to get it in as many different places as, as they possibly can. Uh, and so kind of democratizing that for people. Uh, I just, somebody posted on Instagram uh, just uh, last week, which was so touching to me, um, 
posted a, a, a comment under one of our stories saying, you know, that they don't have TV. The only access that they have to news is on their cell phone. And so they were just really grateful for um, what we are doing and, and their ability to access that. Um, because uh, the, the, really, they, they just have very limited ways to, to, um, to follow politics, but they are somebody who is interested, right? And so uh, we uh, are also nonpartisan. So we are trying to be a home for everybody that is interested in this democracy, whether they want to live here or not. Uh, we continue to reach out to them. So that's people across the political spectrum um, that is yes, obviously focused on um, centering women, but, but, but um, we are very intersectional newsroom. And so that means we're talking about LGBTQ issues and, and really framing uh, all issues as, as women's issues and, and talking about voters, um, not monolithically, but, but as who gets to be a rural voter, who gets to be an educated voter, who gets to be a Supreme Court voter, who gets to be a faith voter, like we're thinking Midwestern, Southern, you name it, like we are reframing that conversation so that it, your default setting is not always white male property owner. Great. Well, thank you. Um, you all doing a really, really good job. So. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, bring in um, Alec and Sewell here, and I want to talk um, for a few minutes because it's an area that really interests me. Um, and then I want to, uh, before Dahlia has to leave at seven, I want to uh, get her thoughts as well on this. Um, so, um, Alec, you uh, wrote a piece um, for the New Yorker and ProPublica, uh, I think it came out last week. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna read a paragraph from it. It's a piece about um, what, what essentially you're calling the, the failures of remote learning during this pandemic. And it's part of a larger um, area that I'm really interested in and that I'd love for us to, to talk a little bit about uh, because I actually haven't seen a ton of reflection and thought here, um, not as much as I expected in terms of the stories that are being told and the stories that aren't, be, aren't being told um, during this pandemic and over these la this last um, you know, eight months or whatever it is. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna read a paragraph. It's a fantastic story. Um, and you say, I've chosen to tell the story of Shamar's remote learning difficulties with his family's permission because it was the plight that alerted me to the fact that remote learning was proving disastrous. As the spring went on, I grew increasingly distressed by the lack of public alarm over students like Shamar who were sitting in countless dark rooms, safe from COVID-19 perhaps, but adrift and alone. Society's attention to them has always been spotty, but they had at least been visible. Um, I'm skipping ahead here. Now they were behind closed doors and so were we with the full license to turn inward. While we dutifully stayed home to flatten the curve, children like Shamar were invisible. Um, I'm curious, I, I, I've watched, um, as, as a magazine writer, I've been really interested in, in I, I'm sort of surprised, in some ways surprised by the lack of reporting about what this is like for young people to, be, to, to have been at home um, in this way for all different kinds of young people, right? So advantaged, disadvantaged, um, this is just like a, 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 an entire change to the way we live that, um, and partially I think because people can't, you know, we had social distancing, so you were limited in terms of how close you could physically get to people and getting in people's homes. But there's so much that, that hasn't been written about. So, so you're coming in to fill in a need here. And over the last few months, you've been really um, critical uh, on Twitter and other places about um, uh, the ways that we've covered this, particularly as uh, when it comes to um, children in schools. And so I, I wanted just to get you to, to talk a little bit about both how that story came to be and, and how it fits into your larger seemingly criticism about um, the way that the, the, the ways that we've covered this and, and not covered this well. Yeah. Well, thanks, Benoit, and, and thanks for having me um, for this part of this. Um, yeah, the story came about because I last spring I saw how disastrous the remote learning was in those first couple months for kids like this one boy that I've been tutoring here in town. And, and, and I was just kind of struck already in March, April, and May how little we were talking about that, how, how they're just how invisible all these kids have become. And I think it was partly because we'd all gotten so hunkered down in our own lives, so hunkered down in our own families, where we were all just kind of turned inward, taking care of ourselves ordering everything in, you know, dealing, dealing with our own kids, Zoom and all that. And, um, and, but I hope that as the summer went on, that this would all become moot, that we would get our act together and that schools would mostly open up come fall in the places where it was safe to do so. 
And then I was just kind of amazed that the summer went on and, and, that, that, and that in a lot of places that actually wasn't happening and that we were gonna start the year doing this all over again. And, and I really have also been struck at how little we're talking about this. I mean, right now in this country, half of all children are not actually going to school. In a lot of cities in this country, kids who are in private school are going to school. Kids who are in public school are not going to school in a lot of cities, including mine here in Baltimore. And that's wild if you think about it. Like that's something out of like South Africa, 1980, or like pick your, pick your analogy. Um, and, and, I've, and, and I do, I see this as having, this is a media problem, but it's also what I think of as kind of a blue America problem. I think they're, it's sort of part of the same thing. And it has a lot to do with the fact that, that blue America in general has had trouble kind of disentangling, separating out its assessment of Donald Trump's failure and Donald Trump's terribleness with its assessment of COVID and COVID risk. Those things have become completely bound up together because of course, Donald Trump's failure has made COVID a lot worse than it needed to be or should have been. And and so it's really hard when you're talking about something like schools to, to think about it clearly because it's gotten so wound up with Trump himself. And that's partly, of course, because Trump was, was pushing so hard and so crudely and brutishly for schools to reopen in July. So everyone kind of like polarized against that and went to the other corner. But it's also, it also goes beyond schools. It, it, there's a, there's a, there are wildly different assessments of COVID risk in this country right now in the two different parts of the country. And, and they become sort of polarized against each other. And one reason I believe that, that folks in blue America have what is arguably now an outsized sense of COVID risk when it comes to schools and other things is that they've seen blue, red America being too too lax, too careless. They see, you know, the guys in Walmart without a mask and all that ridiculousness. And Blue America reacts against that in its in its own forms of arguable excess. So we still have playgrounds that are um, that are got yellow tape around them. We still have people being shamed around, you know, the sort of the beach shaming, the, the moralizing around outdoor activities. And and that's all kind of in a way, not that big a deal, right? If a jogger gets shamed for running without a mask, big deal. But it does become a big deal when, if it gets to the point where we're keeping schools closed, even in cities that have remarkably low rates of COVID. And, and the fact that we're not really, really looking at that squarely head on and what that means right now, and, and the fact that it's not just that half of all kids in the country are not, aren't going to school now, but of course the, the racial disproportion within that is enormous. Black and brown kids right now are twice as likely, more likely not to be going to school. Um, it's just astonishing. It's astonishing that we're coming out of the summer of, of Black Lives Matter, the rejuvenation of Black Lives Matter and in, 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 in our attention to all, all these disparities. And now we're heading to a school year where only one, last I checked, only one quarter of black children are getting to actually go to school and that's mostly red states. You're, it's, the, it's black children are much more likely to be going to school now in t Florida or Texas or Tennessee or Georgia than they are in, in our liberal bastions. And we're not, we're not really talking about that. And I find that really remarkable. Yeah, and I wanna, I wanna uh, broaden it out and I wanna bring Sewell in now um, uh, as well. And then anyone else can, can jump in. Um, I, I, I'm curious, um, so when you when we think about um, uh, you know let's take your newspaper the Los Angeles Times um, and what are the um, I'm curious about the the range of stories are there are there are there story areas related to the pandemic that have been um, that you all have wanted to cover at the Times that you just haven't been able to cover for whatever reason and when you look at uh, at the at the Los Angeles Times coverage of the pandemic. Um, what do you make of it? What do you think about its, its, um, its fairness? What do you think about um, the, the stories that you think you all covered well and, and stories that maybe you haven't been able to do? 
Well, Benoit, first of all, thanks for this opportunity to speak to um, the Emerson College students. Um, and I'm really just grateful for this opportunity as well to um, be reunited with you and also to uh, speak alongside journalists I, whose work I've admired for a very long time. Um, you ask a great question. I'm particularly proud of the LA Times' coverage of the disproportionate effects of the pandemic on uh, Black and Latino communities. Um, obviously, uh, Los Angeles is a city that's uh, more than 40% Latino in a county that's nearly half Latino, the largest county in the nation. And uh, we've done, I, I think, a really good job of looking at how the inequality has expressed itself. I think our coverage has contributed to policy effects, such as the announcement this week that the county will, counties in general in, in California will not be allowed to reopen unless they can show that the poorest and, and least well-off have lower infection rates. So, you know, instead, so it, it, it's a very, very bold decision by, by Governor Newsom. But I think, you know, we've done a good job spotlighting how the experience of the pandemic has been so different uh, for those living in South Los, Los Angeles, those living in more deprived areas. Um, I would say also uh, that we've done a good job putting a human face on the pandemic. We decided early on that we were going to focus on uh, Californians who've lost their lives to this disease. And we've done just really cool portraits of, of grief, really and of loss and reminded our readers every day that there's a human face to this, that it isn't just uh, uh, numbers. Um, I would love for us to see, uh, and I'm sure other news organizations feel this way, you know, kind of more bandwidth, especially on the cover of health and science. You know, we have a fantastic group of health and science reporters, but I think this is a moment that cries out for expertise, that cries out for authority. I'm reflecting on what other uh, others have said on this panel, and I think you know, look, I think Alec, especially, uh, there's a really good point here. I, I get frustrated when coverage of how terrible Trump is, and he's terrible, uh, out shadows, takes the oxygen out of the room, and kind of almost intellectually dumbs us. Not, not just he intellectually dumbs us, which he does, uh, but, but it, there's a deadening effect for the conversation. You know, Trump took advantage brilliantly, masterfully of circumstances that have been decades in the making. Deregulation, rising corporate power, rising inequality, wage stagnation, deindustrialization, which Alex's documentary um, on Dayton, Ohio, which I saw recently on Frontline so well uh, uh, chronicles, uh, the, the rural urban divide, the polarization. So, you know, he exploited these conditions and he has hastened I would argue, I'm in an opinion job now, so I can offer a little bit of opinion. I would argue he's hastened the very decline that his followers believe they fear. And it's important to cover that, but it's also important to remember there will be an America post-Trump, whether that's January or 2025. And in a way, we as journalists need to keep our eyes on that ball. How do we protect this fragile democracy whose institutions and values were far more fragile and, and than, than we all believed. Yeah, and um, Dahlia, I know you have to, uh, we have about 15 minutes with you left. So I wanna uh, make sure I get uh, you in here on, on this question. Um, and then I wanna uh, uh, talk a little bit um, uh, about, and, and I will bring Sewell back in uh, later for this, about, I'm really interested in one of the debates we've had since this summer is um, uh, what is the what is the acceptable range of opinion that uh, can be published uh, now, um, and I want to read a, a paragraph from the infamous uh, Harper's letter, um, which uh, became a very big story uh, this summer, and um, and then I just want to um, have your thoughts on it. Um, so the free exchange of information and ideas. The lifeblood of a liberal society is daily becoming more constricted. And these are the, uh, the signees of this letter, what they're uh, arguing. Well, we have come to ex uh, expect this on the radical right. Censoriousness is also spreading more widely in our culture. An intolerance of opposing views, a vogue for public shaming and ostracism, and the tendency to dissolve complex policy issues in a blinding uh, moral certainty. We uphold the value of robust and even caustic counter speech from all quarters, but it is now all too common to hear calls for swift and severe retribution. Um, I'm curious about uh, the letter and, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious about it in terms of helping our students um, who are thinking about going into publishing and journalism um, 
uh, put it in some context. So one of the interesting reactions that um, came from this letter was that a lot of people on social media were like, oh my God, I can't believe Dolly assigned it, right? And, um, and there was this uh, sort of disbelief that, because um, a lot of these folks are, are very left of center. Um, and, um, and I'm curious, one of the things that, one of the criticisms of the letter has been that it, well, there's two, two criticisms that I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on. One is, is that there is so much else to worry about in the world right now that this is lower on the list. The second criticism was, was that these are essentially um, elite folks who are worried about being deplatformed. Um, and, and I'm curious about your reaction to, 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 this, um, to this letter and the conversation that we had culturally around it. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was a really, you know, just to your first point, I, I was really startled. The letter came down in the last week of the Supreme Court term. And so I was like trying to cover, you know, 50 cases and like do my job. And I was amazed that it was like a 10 day, you know, myopic, like it's all anyone wanted to talk about. So I sort of had uh, the paradoxical reaction that like, saying that the letter was sucking up all the oxygen from more important things was actually like a conversation that sucked up all the oxygen from what like I believed at the time were kind of catastrophic news events. And I thought in some sense, it was really interesting watching journalists talking to journalists about journalism and also like really just the level of viciousness um, surprised me. Um, I had many, many people write and say, you know, I've followed you for 20 years. You're dead to me. You're a monster. And I was like, okay, well, that's part of the reason that people signed this letter um, was that, you know, if, if, if you don't like actually want to read me ever again because of that, like that's a little bit uh, putting into evidence why the letter was important to a lot of us. So I actually thought the sort of amount of attention it got was exactly wrong in some sense, in, you know, just to go to your question. Mm -hmm. You know, on the question of, I, I mean, I will say overwhelmingly, to the extent that, that people were litigating the letter, it was, you know, how dare you sign a letter that J.K. Rowling signed, like how did, you know, sort of you clearly have now associated yourself with every tweet that every person in this letter has ever tweeted out, which was, again, I think emblematic of why a lot of people in the letter signed the letter, um, because it just can't be the case that no one's ever going to read my Supreme Court coverage again because I was one of, you know, dozens and dozens of signatories and they don't like one of J.K. Rowling's tweets. So again, I just kept feeling as though the response was surfacing the problem. Uh, now, whether, you know, the letter was crafted perfectly, I think it was both too specific and too abstract. I mean, there were just a million problems with the letter qua letter, but I thought, the most fascinating um, criticism was the one, you know, you raised at the very end, which is, this is just a lot of famous people worried about being deplatformed. And I was sort of, again, thought I had the opposite response. One being, you know, I'm not at all worried about being deplatformed. I thought I was using my platform to amplify a lot of people who didn't get to come forward and say, I'm terrified. Uh, so I actually had this sense that what better use of my platform than to raise these questions that I think are hugely problematic. And so again, I, I think the, the sort of total inversion of a lot of <laughs> the, the sort of themes of why the letter was signed and, and what the critiques were uh, and how they completely, I think, subverted what the intent of the letter was, was really interesting. But you know, I guess I would just say and I think this goes to Alex's point too. The, one of the fundamental mistakes I think we make in journalism is that we want to keep having these umbrage episodes, right? And so, you know, it's just one outrage after another. And like two weeks ago, I was writing about people, you know, in ICE detention who were having, um, you know, hysterectomies without being advised or giving informed consent. That story got worse not better. It had, what, a 22-hour 
life in the news cycle. And so I think that for me, part of the problem is, and this goes to, again, I think, you know, just some of Aaron's points about how we monetize journalism, <laughs> because we monetize journalism by jacking up these umbrage episodes and people get really bored of their umbrage. Like by tomorrow, they just don't care that, you know, Justice Alito and Justice Thomas want to overturn um, marriage equality. It'll be gone. And I think that for me, this by necessity having to reflect back to the public the issues that they see themselves in, they identify, they like feel themselves to be in this fight and our need to sort of, I always sort of say like, I think journalism should be holding up a window, not a mirror. Mm -hmm. And I think that we keep holding up mirrors to people so that they can act out their outrage over and over and over again. And because that's what they want to do and that's what they will pay for. Uh, and that's certainly, I think, what cable news has really, really scarily fall, fallen prey to. Um, I, I see, in some sense, a lot of what went on in that Harper's letter was people acting out umbrage over blank spaces <laughs> in that letter that uh, were neither in evidence nor really the issue. And I just think we're so quick to tell those stories instead of, you know, what Alec is trying to tell about half of our children not being in school, because that's not a story that somehow people want to pay to bet, be angry about. And I just think every, every stage of that is just so wrong. And I am not in any way sort of capable of unpacking how to fix it. But I do think that you know, when I look at the pieces that I write or the podcasts I do that get just exponentially more traffic, it's the pieces I'm most embarrassed about because I wrote them angry and judgy and overheated. And I just think that's what everyone wants to consume. I, I hope everyone on this panel thinks I'm wrong or alternatively has a solution. Thank, thank you, Delia, for that. And I know you'll you'll have to disappear in a few minutes. And um, so if I don't get to say bye, thank you <laughs> for doing this on such short notice. Um, I want to bring in Aaron and Sewell and Alec on this. Um, you know, I Sewell, I, I'm, you know, I have a specific question for you and that I'm really interested in. You've been working in newspapers for a long time um, as an editorial page editor. I'm, I'm curious about how that job has changed um, in terms of or if it's changed um, in terms of um, the calculations that you have to make before um, accepting a story. Um, Aaron, I'd love for you to jump in whenever you want around um, both of these issues. And, and, and again, uh, you know, right now we're in the middle of, of obviously uh, an election, which is we're, all we're talking about, but um, other kinds of stories that are not being um, reported, um, uh, I, I would love to talk about as well. So. Um, well, that's a huge question, Benoit. Thank you. Um, you know, I, 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 opinion journalism has changed. Uh, arguably, it has not changed enough yet. Um, and the risk for newspapers is that the way we do opinion journalism may be surpassed. Because the fact is that quick takes, you know, are on Twitter all over the place. There's instant reactions all over the place. You can often find the most interesting angles by just following the kind of social media conversation. Those angles, of course, are not necessarily the deepest, most reflective, or, 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 most, uh, or most analytical. So I think, you know, I kind of separate my job into two buckets. Um, one, leading the editorial board. You know, I lead a group of people who write unsigned editorials and I, I've asked them, you know, does the unsigned editorial still have a role in 2020? Um, we believe uh, the answer is yes. I mean, it is, a, it's a, it serves as a moderating voice, but when you look at the endorsements that we made, we were the first, you know, major newspaper to endorse Biden. When you look at the um, apology, we so we just published our reckoning with racism, which yep. was a multi-part series um, two two Sundays ago, uh, anchored by um, an editorial that came from our team, like that basically looked at the inst the history, institutional history of the LA Times and its complicity with white supremacy, its complicity in kind of making and remaking Los Angeles the physical space of the city, uh, its role in kind of neglecting the Latino and black communities that transformed the city, uh, not to mention the support for incarceration of Japanese Americans. It was a lot to take in. But I think one reason that project landed and resonated with readers is that it was really coming from us as an institution. 
The second part of my job is kind of uh, helping to oversee the op-ed pages, which is something I also did for the New York Times a number of years ago. And I think there the kind of challenges that Dahlia is posing are really, really at the fore right now. You know, uh, this, it's uh, no secret that there was this whole controversy over Senator Tom Cotton's op-ed in the New York Times arguing uh, that the president should consider the use of active duty military troops to, uh, to quell uh, unrest. I came out at the time as thinking that that opinion was, was uh, not, not good journalism. I, I did not say, and I do not believe that Senator Cotton should or could or can be censored. I did think that in choosing whose perspectives to platform, to surface, to kind of lend, you, you look, I, and my views have changed on this. I used to think, look, we're a neutral platform, kind of anything goes, the more provocative, the better. And, but, but, you know, I have changed a little bit. I think that when you're choosing to publish something in the LA Times or Slate, you are giving it a little bit of the imprimatur of that organization. You're not saying I agree with this point of view, but you are saying that we have gone through this and consider it to be a point of view worthy of consideration by our readers. Now, should that spectrum be wide? It should be wide. But I think the fact, facts have to be checked. I think if Cotton had, if they had gone back to Cotton and said to him, look, the governors don't want this. Uh, there's limited, there's legal restrictions on the use of active duty military. There's no sign that the National Guard is failing. Uh, you've got people in the National Security Establishment very anxious. If you can answer these questions, and you can kind of po pose a reasoned argument as to why you're, you know, something so drastic as using the military on our own citizens should happen, then we'll consider it as an op-ed. And fr frankly, some of my most productive, productive experiences when I was an op-ed editor at the New York Times was working with conservatives, religious conservatives, social conservatives, fiscal conservatives. My job wasn't to change their point of view. My job was to help them make the strongest, most reasoned, best defended case possible, so as to open the space to a wide variety of debate. Aaron or Alec, do you wanna jump in on this at all? No, okay. <laughs> um, so Alec, uh, Alec, you're muted. I was gonna say, I, I, oh. I think both of the- I'll, I'll, pass, I'll, I'll pass and talk about it, uh, but. Uh, Aaron, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I was thinking about um, Alex's very good story, um, you know, about um, virtual learning and the inequality ar around this pandemic across a number of facets, really every facet of our society. But I, I do think that education is probably the biggest um, inequality that has been exposed uh, in the midst of all of this and, and, and the inequality extends to the reopening. And that is a story that we should be sticking with and that we haven't stuck with nearly enough. Um, so when I pivoted kind of off the campaign trail and on to focusing on how women are being, um, what, what women's relationship is to the pandemic, um, I proposed a series. Hi, Dahlia. Hi, Dahlia. Uh -huh. I proposed a series um, because I was basically stuck in Philadelphia and couldn't leave. Uh, Philadelphia is the poorest big city in America, and inequality was already on full display in Philadelphia. And so I thought, well, what if I told the story of the pandemic through one woman at a time, taking on a different issue every week um, from Philadelphia? And so we called it Portraits of the Pandemic, and every week uh, for a couple of months, I focused on somebody different. And one of the first people that I focused on was a teacher uh, who was very excited um, at the beginning of the school year, she was teaching high school history and trying to get her students engaged and interested in learning. A lot of them had, you know, just kind of not been seen in that way before. And so she was having, it was her first year at this high school. She just was very optimistic going into that year. And, uh, and then the pandemic hit um, and, you know, she basically, uh, to Alex's point, lost track of about half of her class, uh, including some seniors. Uh, who she didn't know, you know, what was going to happen to them. People who she knew were frankly not uh, safe at home, uh, when home was supposed to be the safest place, you know, in a pandemic. She knew that wasn't the case for a lot of her students, um, and yet she hadn't heard from them. Uh, you know, Philadelphia had not frankly thought through um, virtual learning, um, the platform that they had, 
uh, you know, they had it in place, but teachers had not really gotten trained on it because they really didn't think they were going to need it, <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden they did need it and didn't know what to do. The students didn't know how to use it either. The ones that had laptops, the ones that didn't, uh, couldn't use it on their phone, you know, and, and you know, that's assuming folks had Wi-Fi and, and, and adequate cell phone access, you know. So there just was a lot that wasn't thought through and people fell through the cracks and, and she was um, really feeling very despondent about that, trying to help who she, could, who she could, but frankly was hoping that the story that I was writing uh, could m maybe, some, maybe some of her students would see it and, and reach out to her uh, and let them know that they were okay and, and, and to ask for help if they needed it because she was trying to do that. Um, the food insecurity around um, children who were not in school, especially in a city like Philadelphia, where folks were getting, you know, children were getting their meals, uh, you know, at school, and that wasn't happening. So they on not only did they have to address the uh, learning access, they had to address the nutrition piece of this for for children, um, and 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 there are cultural components to that too. There's a huge Black Muslim population here in Philadelphia. There's a huge immigrant population here, where you know, there's a cultural sensitivity to the things that are put in the, in the boxes of food that people get. That, and, you know, thinking, thinking through all of those things um, were just, I mean, there was a story after story to be done uh, here. And, and, you know, I think just like with the election, um, you know, to Sewell's point, telling these stories through the people who are being directly impacted, right? I mean, yes, we have 200,000 plus dead of coronavirus, but millions and millions of people are being impacted by this pandemic, whether they ever get sick or not, whether they ever know anybody that gets sick or not, they are being impacted. And so hearing from them about what their lived reality is, right? I mean, at the 19th, I just put the lid on a story before I came in here. I just talked to a bunch of women um, who frankly are making a lot of sacrifices in this pandemic. They're trying to figure out how to navigate their new normal. They're taking precautions, right? They're masking, they're doing everything that you know, the medical professionals tell them to do, and then the president gets coronavirus uh, after he did not follow the rules and kind of flouted the rules. Uh, you know, but our story wasn't going to be about him. Our story was not going to be about, um, you know, something that frankly, a lot of people were surprised didn't already happen. Not that I'm wishing that that had happened to him. Of course not. I hope that, that he recovers fully. I just was looking at pictures of him walking out of Walter Reed today. So, um, you know, but, but, but the story really is, you know, for the women who we know uh, were masking up more this summer than men who are doing most of the um, figuring out of caregiving um, and, and are in that sandwich generation where they're having to care for children and elderly loved ones, like they're looking at this and they're pissed. Like, that, like there's just no other way to say it. They are furious to see that this, that, 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 that this has happened and, and also thinking about, you know, him getting the best possible health care that, that so many people would never have access to the kind of treatment that he got, um, you know, and they get sick through no fault of their own. So like thinking through, thinking through stories focused on the voters and focused on um, the American people who are being impacted right. by what's going on right now um, is really what I'm super focused on, and especially in the last 29 days now until the election, like we know who Joe Biden is, we know who um, Donald Trump is like what we need to know is who the voters are and what they're going to do right because that is the variable here there's nobody who doesn't know who the two of them are yeah um, um, great, great. and Alec just really quickly I want to tell students uh, that uh, if there are anyone watching in the Q&A to please um, we have a few questions which uh, we'll get to a couple but um, would love some more questions so if you have a question for one of the panelists or all of the panelists um, please type that in the Q&A um, now, and Alec, I know you want to jump in with an answer. I'd also love for you to just quickly tell us, just in a minute or so, you wrote the book, literally wrote the book on Mitch McConnell, um, what you're sort of expecting from him in terms of, um, you know, the next, uh, you know, two or three weeks. Sure. Um, well, real quickly on stories I would love to like to see more of. Um, I, would, I would like to see more stories on on the schools front from places that have actually opened schools. There's this weird level of abstraction to a lot of our debate in, in all these cities that have schools closed where we're like, oh, what would happen? We, we don't know what would happen if we open our schools. Well, in fact, half the schools in this country are open and it's a sign of how concentrated our media has become that we're all in sort of DC and New York and, and a couple other places and we're not actually 
getting stories from all these places where things are actually open. And, and so far from afar, it seems like things are actually kind of going okay. Um, the other thing I would love to see more stories about is, or just more, I'd like to see in the stories that we're doing about the effects of the pandemic, I would like to see the lines drawn a little bit more to actual decisions that we're making about how to deal with the pandemic. A lot of these stories about, uh, about how various kinds of people are, are suffering, whether it's small business owners or working moms who are, who are you know, dealing with, with um, the kids at home, are, they, they, they're all cast as you know, the, the effects of the pandemic, the cost of the pandemic, when in fact, we have made certain decisions about how to deal with the pandemic. Um, and just the other day, there was a story about women, women professors, women faculty who are now deal, dealing with a tenure, trying to get, get, get tenure, and it focused on Northwestern, women professors at Northwestern who are struggling to get tenure while they've got the kids at home. Well, they've got the kids at home because Evanston, Illinois, decided to, and surrounding areas decided to keep the schools closed despite having really good numbers. And, and so there's just, there should be a little bit more line, drawing of lines to our actual decision makers to just sort of basic accountability kind of reporting rather than just kind of casting it as, oh, COVID. Um, on, on McConnell- Accountability uh, at the local level, to your point, Alec, like it's not just the, the lack of a plan or, or choices that are being made at that federal level. Right, exactly. It's specific decisions being made and, and some places they're being made differently. And the fact is right now, um, there's been much less of a hit to the economies in states that have taken a somewhat laxer approach to COVID and we can, you know, you can debate that, debate that all day, but it's, a, but it's a reality. And, and I would like to see a little bit more sort of reckoning with those actual local state decisions and their effects. Um, on McConnell, it's so hard to say how things are going to play now because so much is up in the air with, with Trump's virus and all the rest. But I would just say that a couple of things I always urge people to keep in mind with McConnell. Um, one is that, um, he so treasures being majority leader of the Senate. That was his life goal. Like most people dream of becoming president, he wanted to become head of the Senate. And so a lot of his calculus in these next few weeks is gonna be him doing whatever he can possibly do to protect the Republican majority in the Senate. He cares a lot about the court, obviously. It's sort of the one policy area that he actually kind of cares about along with campaign finance. But, um, but he really cares most, most of all about remaining head of the Senate. Um, and, and so that's going to figure a lot in his calculations. The other thing I would say is that I just get very, I get very weary of the media talking about his brilliance, tactical brilliance. And there's all, we still see these stories now about how, how, how he's so, you know, so ahead of the Democrats in, in sort of playing these tactical games, strategic games. Um, you know, what's, what's this wizard McConnell going to pull out of his hat now? Those kind of stories. You see them still all the time. The fact is, if you're willing to smash all the norms, if you're willing to just completely brazenly smash the norms and four years ago not allow even a hearing on a, on a judicial nominee who was picked in March um, of an election year, and then now just push ahead, brazenly push ahead with this nomination, um, it's easy to seem like you're brilliant and sort of like, ahead of the game and, and the cleverest guy ever, but you're actually not. You're just willing to smash the norms. And so I just would constantly be urge people to be on guard against that kind of coverage of him. Yeah. Um, I want to uh, jump in. There's some student questions here. Um, uh, let me just, so they're coming in fast. Uh, so we've got one from Rory, uh, a 20 year old Emerson student. I mean, this goes to a larger question. Um, do you think nonpartisanship really exists in journalism now that simple things like mask wearing and climate change have been politicized? Um, I mean, this gets to a very deep question. Anyone want to offer Rory an answer to that? Um, I'm, I'm glad to answer it. I've been wrestling with this for a long time because I've been, I used to be, you know, pure straight newspaper reporter and now I've merged into more kind of magazine writing where there's somewhat looser lines, and I've wrestled a lot with this question. And what I've what I've kind of come around to from some some years now is that the goal, as I see it, shouldn't be some kind of pure neutrality, pure balance, pure objectivity. If such a thing is even possible, um, I'm going to be writing with perspective. Um, and in some of my pieces, I'm even bringing sort of a first person perspective, but. But the goal, there still has to be a goal, and the goal has to be, 
even if you're bringing that perspective, the goal still has to be total, total accuracy and total fairness, like fairness, intellectual fairness, intellectual honesty um, to sort of the other side of, of whatever the question might be, um, actually reaching out, actually giving, giving the argument, fair, the points fair consideration. Um, and so those have become my new, my ho new holy grail. Um, and, and it does mean that you're, if you're really doing that, you might sometimes end up finding yourself surprised to be maybe on the other side of a certain question. And that has happened with me somewhat on this issue of our response to COVID, where I've actually become somewhat wary of some of the claims being made by the left of center side where most of my pieces usually reside. Right. I think what I would add to that is, you know, we are seeking to be a place for marginalized voices to be heard. And, and that includes marginalized voices that are not necessarily um, the voices that, that you would assume would be, you know, in certain publications. Um, there are a lot of different folks in, in this country who, um, you know, actually are and, and are feeling marginalized in this moment, especially around politics. So many people that cannot have, um, you know, conversations about our politics and about our democracy with their family, with their community, with their friends uh, in this moment. And so we seek to be a place for uh, that kind of civil and civic dialogue. Um, tell me the other part of the question again, Benoit. Uh, well, let's, I actually want you to oh, jump the in. Nonpartisan piece, the nonpartisan piece, right? Right. But let me ask you another question that you can jump into because I'm, I'm interested in this. Uh, so we have a question from Emma Castor, who's 20, a publishing major. Does it get exhausting writing about such bleak, depressing subjects? How do you find the energy to keep talking about these issues while we are living through them every day? I just want to add to that question. It is a, it is a really, you know, I was talking to a, uh, a, this question of how as writers and journalists and publishers who are uh, living this and, and reading the news um, every day and living on our phones, um, the, the challenge of, of uh, because a lot of folks can just turn it off, right? And so, um, and, and we generally can't. And I'm curious about strategies for those who want to be writing about these things, about, um, you know, self-care and, you know, do you turn off your phone for two hours a day and just say, I'm not looking at my phone? Like, how do you, how do you, I, I'm assuming you all have therapists, like, how do you do this um, okay. in, in, in writing about this? Well, first of all, yes, shout out to my therapist. Uh, standing appointment every week. We do not miss our conversation. And, and really, I tell, the, I'll tell you guys that because, um, you know, my therapist actually has me on Google Alert. And that's something that she started doing because she was trying to get to know me as much as she possibly could and was like, hey, I saw this story that you wrote about that was kind of rough. Do you want to talk about that? And I'm like, talk about it for what? Like, I'm a journalist. I'm writing these stories. I'm moving on. Like, what do you mean? But like actually unpacking and processing how I may have felt uh, about writing about, especially, you know, stories about race and gender that, that are closely tied to my own lived experience. Um, I didn't understand um, you know, maybe when I was on the ground, say in Ferguson, how useful and necessary it was for me to actually process that with someone, uh, particularly a professional. Hello, shout out to my benefits. So um, I definitely encourage that. Um, I will also say to, to the earlier question, um, you know, I have believed for a long time, you know, because I've spent most of my career writing about race, that my job is really to leave behind the most honest and accurate record about who and where we are as a country. Like that is my job. Uh, and so that is what I try to do uh, in my work. And, you know, as somebody who is now in a newsroom where I really do feel like I'm bringing my lived experience to the work as an asset, not a liability, um, I feel like I'm really able to do that. But I mean, like, just because masking is something that has become politicized does not mean that we as an outlet have to politicize it, right? Like we, we are listening to medical experts. Medical experts say that wearing a mask is going to keep us safe and keep prevent people from dying. Like that is not me taking a political stance to reinforce that message for, uh, for people, especially um, the majority of the U.S. population and workforce and essential workers and frontline workers, um, you know, who are women, by the way. So, um, so that is what I would say to that. And then to answer the last question, just in the interest of time, um, 
I, like I said, I've covered race for most of my career. Um, I, when I started, I thought I was going to kind of be writing about the vestiges of racism, kind of the dying out of a lot of um, the racism that we've seen for so long in this country. And, you know, the last several years of my career, I've written about kind of the retrenchment of a lot of that and um, what feels like um, the loss of progress in a lot of um, areas of our society, uh, especially around the issue of race. And yes, that can wear on you. Yes, there are days when uh, you definitely, um, th they're definitely harder than others. But, but honestly, what keeps me going is just the realization that there are people that did this work before me uh, in much harder circumstances that were really, really putting their bodies on the line. Uh, and, you know, they did that not necessarily even knowing if the stories that they were writing were going to change anything, if they were going to see the kind of change that they were trying to bring about in their lifetimes, right? Like I can write that, you know, the, uh, you know, the unrelenting killing of black people, even in the midst of a pandemic by law enforcement needs to stop. That may not happen while I'm alive, but, but the work that I'm doing hopefully continues to push the, that work forward. Uh, and, you know, the people that come behind me that read the stories that I write, uh, will know that I told the truth about this era. You know, like I'm telling the truth about this election, about the racial and gender dynamics that, that happened um, on my watch, frankly. Um, I don't want somebody to come behind me, you know, 20, 50, 100 years later and wonder what happened here and say, oh, it looks like this very interesting eccentric person, you know, uh, was president of, of the United States. And wasn't that interesting as opposed to what actually like, like the racism uh, that, that was just rampant uh, in, these, in these four years and, and what that meant and what that did to this democracy. Like I want to be able to say that um, clear eyed. And, and so that's objectivity. We could, we could have a whole separate <laughs> you know, meeting about, about that conversation. I'm not really um, somebody who is subscribed to that because it's easy to be objective when you are white and male and you made up the rules of journalism. I want to uh, get more questions in. We've got a lot. And sorry, everyone, we're not going to get to all of them in our last 10 minutes here. But um, uh, we've got a question from Tom Garback. Uh, does the rising socialism in the nation among youth get fairly covered? Or is it overshadowed by stigma against socialism? Um, curious, uh, anyone wants to um, take that? No? Okay, we're gonna keep going. Um, uh, I, I'm actually curious about, uh, there's been a few questions around um, sort of the future of journalism, the future of magazines in particular. Um, I'm curious about, there's a lot of pessimism. Um, obviously, uh, there's a lot of pessimism right now um, in the magazine industry, uh, particularly. Um, Alec, I know uh, you write for magazines, I write for magazines. Um, I'm curious for Alec or Sewell or anyone um, to, uh, to jump in around um, the future of this and the future of um, long form writing and the future of how we monetize um, uh, this. Um, and I'd, I'd love for anyone to, to jump in on that. Well, I'll, I'll say this about the future of, of magazines. The, the National Reckoning on Race is about the um, reckoning around the institutions in this country and no institution is immune from that. And that includes American newsrooms, that includes the magazine industry. And so they need to, um, they need to look more like um, this country. And I think that we are starting to see more representation on a lot of the covers, a lot of the cover stories. Um, but until the writers and the decision makers and the gatekeepers are also diversified, you know, it's not enough. Uh, and that's starting to happen. Uh, certainly, Radhika, who you all are going to have uh, coming to Emerson. Uh, that, I mean, that was huge. That was a huge thing. Um, I think uh, I just saw Food and Wine got um, a black editor as well, a black woman editor. Um, I mean, like, th like this means something. The storytelling is different when this happens. That you know, Tana Hasi, um, you know, um, guest editing Vanity Fair uh, and putting Breonna Taylor on the cover and 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 having that kind of representation like that only happens when. Uh, you have certain perspectives uh, that are centered. Uh, that, that, that really does mean a lot. And so I, I'm hoping that that is um, 
something that magazines are reckoning with as well and, and are looking at this and, and looking inward and saying, what do we need to do uh, to change? Because I think what we have also found out this summer is that consumers are absolutely demanding that companies and corporations and institutions of media uh, are backing up um, you know, their so-called commitment to Black Lives Matter. It's not enough for you to have a black square on your social media for one day. Like you have to live these values and, and, and that is going to frankly require um, a lot of the kind of introspection that the institutions like, thankfully the LA Times has done to be transparent and honest about um, you know, who they have not been up to this point and who they wanna be going forward. Sewell, I'd love for you to jump in just on anything we've talked about, um, you know, here in the last 20 minutes or on the future of, um, you know, publishing and journalism and where you think we're going. Yeah, that's really like a, that could be its own, that's that impossible. Be a two hour conversation. Um, yeah. in, instead of offering a comprehensive answer, let me, let me point to a few signs of, of kind of hope uh, for me, sources of hope and optimism. Yeah. Um, one are the nonprofit news outlets, such as ProPublica, where Alec works such as the 19th where Aaron works, where so much innovation is happening, particularly nonprofit, and also I would add the nonprofit local newsrooms, Mississippi Today, Texas Tribune, Cal Matters, the city in New York City. So um, these, uh, you know, they are, they are small in scale. I'm not sure that they single-handedly will address the extinction, the existential threat to local news that is being posed right now, but they're part of the answer. And I give a shout out to them. Secondly, I give a shout out to Substack and to platforms and technologies that are helping to empower individual creators. Mm -hmm. So there's a move right now where very experienced journalists are saying, hey, I've been in the business 30 years. I have my established following or base. Um, you know, I'm not going to blog because it's not going to be free. But if you pay me just a small amount, maybe $5 a month, and I can get 5,000 people to do that, you know, that's enough to make a living on. And they're saying that their expertise is worth paying for, which I think is fantastic. Uh, that gets us to the third, you know, uh, third in the legacy area where I work. I am uh, happy about the move toward local ownership. If you look at the Boston Globe, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, Seattle Times, Dallas Morning News, really? Los, Los Angeles Times, we are institutions that have been battered. And some of the battering occurred, frankly, when we were owned by chains that put profits over journalism. But they're all, all, all these papers I mentioned are now locally owned by people who are in the community. That's not something to be taken for granted. I think the chain model has kind of played itself out. Now, whether these institutions can be revived remains to be seen. But at least we're making a value case and a, and a pitch to our community saying, if you value local news, if you value accountability journalism, if you value pluralism in your news, if you want a diversity of perspectives, so it's not just coming all from East Coast media, you know, invest in local news, invest in it as the public good that it is. So those are three areas of hope. Um, I like, I'd love your, yeah. yeah uh, I've also, you know, thought a lot about this because I, I worry about it so much. I, I love magazines. I love writing for magazines. I love reading them. I get, I still get about two dozen magazines at home here and I just, I, I read them. I love them. I, I, I've just come to love the form, and I do worry that even with these, these some of these green shoots and good things happening with with the nonprofits and um, whatnot, that I worry about the magazines making it. About the some of them will make it. Um, I feel I'm very fortunate to to write for some of the ones that will will make it. But it is it is particular form, and those uh, a great magazine piece and. And you need editors to make it work. Like I, I rely entirely on my editors. And if I don't have an editor who, who is working for some magazine helping me with a given piece, it's just not going to happen. And, and, um, and so there's just something about it, it is, you know, there, yes, it's great that we have ProPublica and some of the others um, like it. But we still need the magazines for the place pieces to run. I do, I believe, unless I, I just. There's just something about that form that that would be a real loss if we if we somehow um, had to make do without it. Yeah, and Alec, um, we just have a minute or so left, and I just want you to be able to talk about your book for 30 seconds. You just finished it. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's about and what you've been working on? Sure, I've been working on it for the last couple of years while I've been doing all these pieces, and it's a big book on something I've been very worried about for a decade, which is regional inequality, the growing gaps between places in America. Um, 
uh, both between not just urban and rural, but between cities that are making it, cities that are not making it. And I tell the story, this, this sweeping nationwide story through the lens of Amazon. Um, I kind of use Amazon as, as, a, as a frame onto the country, what we're becoming as a country. Uh, and then of course the pandemic has greatly exacerbated it all vastly more topical with this incredible surge in, in online everything and, and sort of evisceration, further evisceration of everything that's local and community. And it's called fulfillment. And it'll, it'll be out in March. Cool. I love it. Yeah. Listen, um, we have a bunch of questions that we're not going to be able to get to. Um, one of the themes that keeps coming up in the questions, though, is that everyone is uh, thanking you all for this conversation. I want to thank you all for this conversation. I want to thank Dahlia, who uh, had to leave. Um, this was really um, great and, and interesting and fascinating, and you're all wonderful, and thank you for doing this. Um, and I hope those who are watching uh, enjoyed it. I think we're going to have a recording, so we'll uh, post that. Um, uh, somewhere. I'll figure out where. And uh, thank you all again for, for doing this tonight uh, in this really busy, weird time that we're living in. So thank you, all of you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. Good luck. Bye, y'all. See ya. Bye.